Uh, we'll be in Matthew 7 this morning. Matthew 7. And I will try to go past this part quickly because you're probably tired of it now at this point. But we have looked, since we hit this in Matthew 5, at this idea that Matthew 5, 17 through 20 is the most significant passage in the Bible about how to read the Bible. Uh, and Jesus talks there about not coming to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Uh, oftentimes, as, as churches, I think we have shown something that is different than that in the way we treat the Old Testament. We have probably heard from an early age, if you've been around church for long, something along the lines of that's all been nailed to the cross and we're New Testament Christians and that. But clearly, Jesus had a value on it. And as he teaches through the Sermon on the Mount, so much of what he teaches originates in the Old Testament, and he is resetting it for New Testament times. Uh, and so we've asked this question several times now, how do we read the Bible? And we talked early on about how oftentimes we will read the Bible, unfortunately, to try to reinforce something we already think. And so we will think, okay, I believe this, so let me get in my concordance, and I will find a verse that agrees with that. Or I guess since we're, we're high tech now, we'll Google search it, uh, or we'll go on Bible Gateway and search, and we'll find verses that reinforce our point of view. And people are kind of geared that way with lots of things, not just Bible, but some will read it that way. Uh, some will read it in the hopes of learning. Some will read it just for information. But as we look here through the Sermon on the Mount, we will see ways that we can read Scripture that will help us to better apply it to our lives. And so this morning, we'll look at that question a little more centered on how do we read the Bible about judging? Now, I will show you uh, here in a second how I think the world reads the Bible about judging. And it begins here in Matthew 7, 1 with two words, judge not. This is how the world reads it. Okay? They read about judging that we are not to judge, and that, that's pretty much it. Uh, I can remember as a kid, we would do memory verses in Bible class, and when we got to the week that it was John 11.35, we were all very excited, because John 11.35 says, Jesus wept. And we thought, well, we can get this one down before next week. We'll be good to go. The world is that way with the first two words of this verse, judge not. And really, any context that comes before or after it, they're not terribly aware of, but these two words they know. And it's our nature too. I don't want to blame the world that's outside of Christianity entirely on this because we tend to do some of the same things. How often do you like to throw someone, someone's own words back at them? Uh, you see them not doing the, set, the thing they've said they're going to do, and so you, just, you have this moment and you're ready to go, and you just lay that on them. Uh, have you ever accidentally done that with your spouse? and realize very quickly right after you've done it what a bad idea that was. Even though it was good logic and debate and all of that, you don't throw those words back at somebody that you care about. The world likes to throw these back at us, and a lot of times we're probably deserving of it. But what Jesus says is more than just judge not. He does not say judge not in, in, our, in our modern day vernacular, drop the mic and then walk away. He has context that goes with judge not. So he says judge not that you be not judged. So it's not just don't judge, it's what are we doing in this? Are we going to be a citizen of the kingdom, or are we going to be God? Which place do we want to take within all of this? Because there are, there are characters within this story. And sometimes maybe it's good for us, I, I can remember when they would do this in uh, middle school Bible class when I was a, a kid, and they would have us act out the Bible story, and they would put us in different characters. And I, I, I'll tell you, I'm not artistic, and I always hated that stuff. But sometimes it would bring to life what you were reading. It's important for us to recognize that there are different characters within this story. And when we put ourselves in the place of judge, where we find ourselves is not as a, citizen, as a citizen of the kingdom. We find ourselves as God. Now, if I were to ask you outside of all this context, do you want to be a Christian today or do you want to be God? Now, there may be a little piece of us that thinks, well, being God sounds all right sometimes. But realistically, we understand that God is God and we're not, and we want to be Christians. We want to be people who follow God. We don't want to be him. But oftentimes, in the things that happen in life, we put ourselves in that spot. We don't put ourselves in the spot of Christian as follower of God. We put ourselves in the spot of God, and in this case, in the role of judge. James says, there is only one lawgiver and judge. He who is able to save and destroy, but who are you to judge your neighbor? So if there's any confusion about all of this, James explains, look, th there is a judge and there are people and that judge job has already been taken. There is somebody who's going to do that and it's, it's not us, it's God. And we can't take God's position. I know that if we were to be sat in front of a situation where we were asked, do you want to take God's position, 
we would say no. But when we get into the things of life, oftentimes we find ourselves there and a little too comfortable with it. For with the judgment you pronounce, verse 2, you will be judged. And when the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Which brings to us another question, how do we want to be judged? Now, I know the answer to this question for me. I want to be judged very mercifully. I, I want to be judged with an awful lot of patience. I want to be judged with very much benefit of the doubt. Uh, I have done many things along the line in married life uh, that I meant well with, and I didn't uh, come across that way to my wife, and I want my, ju- my wife to be very, <laughs> my judge, my wife to be very patient with me. I, I want her to assume, okay, Brian loves me and is trying to do the best he can for me, and so whatever really dumb thing he has just done, surely he didn't mean to do it that way. Surely there was something else going on here, and I just need to delve beneath the surface and see what he was really trying to do because I, I know he loves me and cares about me. And when we interact with each other, I think we want that same sort of judgment, don't we? When we inter- interact with God, we definitely want that kind of judgment. We want God to look at us and say, well, he or she is a follower of mine. He or she cares about me. And because of that, I know that whatever this thing is he's done, surely that's not what he meant by that. I, I, there's something more to it than that. And I'm going to judge him patiently and caringly. And so he tells us, well, you're going to judge that way if you want to be judged that way. Uh, I've been reading a book this week uh, called The Christian Atheist. And I will tell you, every now and then I will read a book just because the title catches me. I was scrolling through a bunch of books on religion, and I thought, interesting title. And the subtitle, if you can't see it up there at the top, says this, Believing in God, but living as if he doesn't exist. Ouch. You know, when we think back to the beginning when we were talking, Christians are so hypocritical. Christians are so judgmental. Christians are so anything other than loving and generous and kind and patient and all the things we need to be as people who have the fruit of the Spirit. Believing in God, but living as if he doesn't exist. And the writer of this, uh, Craig Grishel, he, he talks about the story of being stopped for something as he was driving. And I don't remember if it was speeding or running a stop sign or what he did exactly, but uh, he was pulled over and the thing that he was pulled over for he had actually done. And so he went to traffic court, and the reason he went to traffic court was he was hopeful that maybe there would be some mercy that came with it, maybe he wouldn't have his his car insurance go up as a result. And so as he sat there in traffic court, he watched person after person after person get up and give excuses. Uh, And it was was like elementary school kids being caught doing something on the playground in there before the teacher or the principal, and you would laugh watching it happen, but probably know you've been there at some point. And so he kept watching these people give up, get up and either give an excuse or talk about how they didn't do what it was or that the, the police officer was wrong. And if each person would, would get through all of that and then the judge would say, here's your fine, go there and pay it, and uh, next. So they finally got to him. Uh, and this guy, by the way, is a, uh, he is a preacher at a very large church, I think in Atlanta, if I remember right. Uh, not a church of Christ, I don't know what, what group he comes from. And so when he stood up, people, a few people in the courtroom knew who he was. And they thought, oh, preacher's in court. This is, this is going to be interesting. Let's see what happens here. And, and the judge even recognized who he was from having seen him uh, in the news or whatever around town. And he said, ah, Mr. Grishel, what brings you in here today? And he stood up and said, well, I did. And he explained what he did. And the judge said, hang on a second. What did, what did you say? And he could tell immediately that the judge just wanted to make an example of all of this. And so uh, he said, well, I, I, I'm guilty. Uh, I did this. And the judge stopped him again and said, could you say that one more time? And he said, I, I'm guilty of what, what I was charged with. I, I did this thing. And the judge stopped him and said, is everyone listening to this? He's guilty. Mr. Grishel, we better get you out of here because we don't need a guilty man like you having any influence on all these innocent people who are here. And he laughed to himself as he saw this whole thing unfold, and he was let off mercifully from the ticket that he should have had. He said, you, uh, you have, you're fine. Just go on home and, and drive safe from here on out. And he received mercy. I will tell you, I've been to traffic court uh, twice in life. Uh, guilty both times. Uh, did the same kind of thing before ever reading that book. Didn't know that's what you're supposed to do. Uh, And both times, the judge was not as merciful as I would have liked for the judge to have been. Did not receive the mercy I was looking for. When we come before our judge, I know what we want. 
We, we want mercy. When we are around others, too often we do not give out the mercy we hope to receive. We judge in a very much different way. So he continues, and he continues here with hyperbole. Uh, Jesus does this every now and then. There are three that really stick out in our minds. There's this one. Uh, there is one about straining gnats uh, and uh, having camels later on the, down the road. Uh, there is one about the, uh, the camel going through the eye of the needle that we read. Here we have this. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? So imagine, if you will, uh, this is a piece of what I cut out in my yard last week. Uh, there was a storm quite a ways back. A uh, big branch came out of the tree, and something that, and this, by the way, there's a pile of this at my house. Anybody need some firewood? Give me a call later. Uh, there are, I don't know, probably 30 of these laying on the ground at my house. Uh, I made them small enough to carry this morning. I didn't want to have a big, giant log up here. Uh, Imagine what it would be like for me to be standing here with that in my eye and to tell you, you, you got a little something right there. Don't you see it? You know how frustrating it is when something gets caught in your eye? I think we've probably all experienced it at this point in life. Uh, if you ever find me doing weed eating at my house, you will see me with the uh, safety glasses on. And the reason I have the safety glasses on is because the, the people who design the weed eater and everybody who knows better tells you to do that. There was one day that I didn't. Uh, I was just in a hurry, just had a little bit of weed eating to do, didn't want to bother with the safety glasses, started weed eating, and sure enough, I shot a piece of uh, grass right into my eye, uh, and it was in there good, uh, and it was a little piece, and I couldn't get, and it was just brutal, and my eyes tearing up and red and everything, couldn't do anything about it. Could you imagine if you had that little something in your eye, and I approach you with that? I tried all week to think of a way I could rig up something to put it on my face, but I, I couldn't do it. What would that be like to you? How comical would that be for you or for anyone watching us? And, and my question is, why do we see one but not the other? I mean, this one is much more visible. Uh, if I were to tell you that there was a, a splinter right here, you would have no idea if there was or not. There's not, by the way. But if, if there was, you'd have no idea. You couldn't see it from where you're at. You couldn't see it, honestly, if you're standing here, unless you really started looking for it in that wood. Why do we see one of these things so clearly and not the other? I think there are a lot of reasons for that. One, I think we are looking in the wrong place. When we see the flaw in our brother or sister so clearly, it's because we are spending far too much time focusing on them instead of ourselves. And so if we're looking there long enough, yes, you are going to see it. You ever uh, paint a room in your house and feel pretty good about it, but then start looking at it a little too long? And then you begin to notice, I know I taped over there, but man, there, there it is. And oh, I missed a spot right there. And uh, that's, it's on the trim over there. And you start to see all the flaws in it. And, and I do that a lot, and I start to think to myself, why, why don't I just not look? Just enjoy the fact that the room is the right color now and it looks clean and everything, but I... I just can't help myself. And a lot of us as Christians, we do the same thing. We just get so focused in on somebody else that we start to see all the flaws. Sometimes we're just not honest with ourselves. I could walk around all day with this thing in my eye and just, I, I don't care. It doesn't bother me. I will get on past it. It will be fine. And we don't want to admit something is there. Uh, men, you understand this when there's something physically wrong, a lot of us do at least. You will have a pain that you can't explain for a long period of time. Uh, I have a friend who in uh, Searcy was a professor of biology at Harding. And he was having a, kind of an ache in his chest. He knew it wasn't right. And yet he just didn't want to go to the doctor because then something would be wrong. And eventually his wife finally said to him, you know it's not going to get better on its own, right? And he finally went, and sure enough, blockage, they had to go in and fix something. And by going when he did, he saved himself a lot of trouble down the road with a heart attack or whatever else may have come. We don't like to look at the flaws in ourselves, so we would rather look at them in others. Uh, the Germans had a word for this, by the way, schadenfreude. Uh, it is this just uncanny ability to look at what's going wrong with someone else and take joy in it so you don't have to think about what's going wrong in your own life. We sometimes don't want to admit our own sins. All of us could admit to ourselves we have sin of some kind, but we don't like to think about that too much. 
and so it's so much easier to focus on someone else's. Their sins are so obvious. I mean, they're, they're really the log, not the speck, right? Look at what they're doing. Everybody can see it. And so for me to point it out, I, why shouldn't I? And why should the, the small thing that I'm struggling with, it's just, that's nothing compared to what you see them doing. Their sins are worse than mine. We categorize, don't we? We have a lot of tendency to, I, I'm going to look at the sin that I have and the sin that you have, and clearly what you're doing is a whole lot worse than what I'm doing. And so we should really fix your problem first, and then if we have time later, maybe, maybe we'll get to mine. Uh, there was a guy who wrote an article in Christianity Today uh, several years ago. And he talked about having visited with someone who was caught in a very public sin. Uh, and this guy had made a, a big mistake in his life and everyone knew about it. And he was just curious about what life and forgiveness and all those things were like in his mind. Uh, and he wrote this statement as he was talking to the guy trying to work through his feelings. Uh, this is Michael Cheshire in Christianity Today. He says, it's amazing how much more mercy... I give to people who struggle with sins I understand. The further their sin is from my own personal struggles, the more judgmental and callous I become. I, I read those two sentences and I thought to myself, log and speck. Because this is who I can be too often. I will look at other people and their sins and I will think, look at what a mess that is. And that is so much worse than mine. And I'll have so little patience because I just don't understand how could anyone get involved in something like that. And the answer, of course, is it didn't usually start with wherever they're at right now. It's just a series of little things that led them to where they are. Who does this sound like? Okay, I'm not asking you to guess who he's talking to that was caught in the sin. But when we think biblically, who does this sound like? And it sounds a lot to me like one of the other times of hyperbole that, that Jesus will go to in Matthew 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you tithe mint and dill and cumin. You have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others, you blind guides, straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. In the stories of the Gospels, you have heroes and villains throughout the stories. And those heroes and villains, when it comes to the Pharisees, I guarantee you the Pharisees would look at the story and they would say, we are going to be the heroes here. We're the ones that know scriptures, we're the ones that practice it, we, we know the law, we can tell you where you are falling short, we can tell you what God wants of you. But when we read the New Testament, have we ever considered the Pharisees to be the hero of the story? They're always the villain. And Jesus is always the hero. And so he says to them, you're so concerned about all these specs that you're missing out on the logs. There are these things that you're not doing that you should so clearly be doing and you're so worried about the little things that you have missed the big things. And so for us, as we look into our own lives, we have to begin to recognize the places that we need to be better rather than being so concerned about the places where other people are falling short. Or how can you say to your brother, verse 4, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye. I love this little comic. This adds a third character to the story. I know this is not in, in Matthew, but this is, you've got the speck and, and beam guys there. And the beam guy is, is getting onto the speck guy. And then there's a third guy, the log guy. And the log guy is laughing at the beam guy for saying something to the speck guy. And the log guy doesn't even begin to recognize he's got the log. And this can be us at times too, can it? We see someone who is getting on to someone else about their sin, and we're so quick to point out the problems with both of them that we forget about ourselves. And the interesting thing within all of this, and by the way, within all of the Sermon on the Mount that can be a challenge to us as Christians today, our tendency to apply all of this really is not even to each other. It's to people who are outside of the church. We look at what they are doing, how they are living, and we say, you guys got to get it together. And the problem with all that is, they're not even living in the same standard by which we're trying to live. Now, there was a time in our country, especially, where the world around us lived an awful lot like we lived. And I will tell you, it made it easier for us to do what we do. But as that has begun to shift, we tend to get angry with the world for changing and forget the fact they were never Christians in the first place. The people who don't follow Christ were, were never 
trying to live by this standard. The world around us kind of had it, and they did it. And now as it has begun to shift, we forget that we always were supposed to be the city on the hill, the light that people could see. And so this is us looking to one another, not, not to a whole other group out there. We have to forget about all of this with others and start to look internally to ourselves. Paul puts it this way in Romans 2. Therefore, you have no excuse. And by the way, if you ever want to pick me up, read about the five, uh, first five chapters of Romans, uh, it is all of the reasons people have no excuse. And so here in Romans 2, he says, Therefore, you have no excuse, O man, for every one of you who judges, for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice these very same things. Speck, log. All the things we judge for, we tend to do those same things. We have to begin to look at ourselves. Uh, I came in a couple weeks ago, maybe been a week ago, I don't remember. Uh, I have a shirt I really like. Uh, it's a plaid, <laughs> I have a series of plaid shirts in my uh, closet. Plaid short sleeve because I'm, I'm hot all the time. Uh, shirts and they go with khaki pants and that's my standard preacher during the week outfit. And I have this one orange shirt that I really like even though I hate all things orange because I'm an Alabama fan. Uh, but anyway, uh, I, sorry Oklahoma State people, but uh, I don't even, I'm indifferent. Orange shirt. For some reason, since day two of having that shirt, after the first time I've washed it, the collar lays down flat on the side. I've ironed it, I've dry cleaned it, I've tried everything I can think of to fix it, and it just, I put the shirt on, collar lays down flat on one side, and it looks silly. And so I figured out, about a half hour before I need to be anywhere, I tuck that collar under, and it's the only thing that works. The problem is I have to remember to take it back out. And so here I walk into church on a Wednesday night, I believe it was two Wednesdays ago. Uh, I have one side of my collar that looks fine, and the other side is completely tucked under uh, on my shoulder. And I probably look crazy. And I must have walked by 15 people before someone finally said to me, you got a collar problem going on there. And then I remembered, oh yeah, I tucked that under so it wouldn't stick. We're so quick, aren't we? And I probably could have come to five of you on the way in and said, hey, you got a little something right, right there, my collar tucked under. We don't look at ourselves. We are so quick to see it in others, and we just don't look at ourselves. You hypocrite. The criticism of the world that we began with. They're, they're hypocrites, they're judgmental. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye. Then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. This is about discernment. It is not about judgment. This is why I, I struggle with the world when it says, hang on, he says don't judge. I, I know we see the word judge here quite a bit through this series of verses. It's about discernment. There is right and wrong, but you need to begin by applying that right and the wrong to yourself before you worry about applying it to someone else doesn't mean things are no longer right or wrong, which is where the world wants to push this to. We can't judge, therefore nothing is right or wrong, therefore everything, as long as you're not hurting somebody else, you just do your own thing. In reality, I think what we will all find is everyone who says, don't judge, you're too judgmental, you can't judge, is very, very good at judging. Just about different stuff. Not about the same things that you do. We see it in others, we don't see it in ourselves. This is about discernment over judgment. Jesus has called us to be people who can discern right and wrong and then, rather than pointing it out in someone else, encouraging it along in each other. It's the reason why we have so many one another verses throughout Scripture. It's never about you fix this in somebody else. It's about let's help each other get better in this together. Iron sharpens iron. It's not one or the other. It's all of us together moving forward in this. So, what is our purpose? If all of this is about judgment, our purpose could be in one thing, but if it's about discernment and we're trying to learn how to be better, then our purpose is entirely different. James, the brother of Jesus, puts it this way. In James 2.13, he says, For judgment is without mercy to one has shown, who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. If you were to go back to that question of what, what sort of judgment do you hope to receive, it's a judgment that is merciful. We are all seeking out mercy. And yet too often, we are unwilling to give that same mercy to someone else. Because after all, they're walking around with that speck in their eye. How can, how can they see with that thing there? And yet as we have the log, we don't, we don't even notice. 
And beyond mercy, what we're really looking for here is reconciliation. What is the purpose of our judgment? The purpose of the judgment of the world too often is to belittle whoever it is they are judging. And that has made its way into the church way too many times. We will look at someone else who is sinning in a different way than us in a way that we don't understand. And we feel when we judge them that we somehow are rising above that. But the purpose of judgment was never that. The purpose of the judgment was reconciliation and mercy. It, it was being able to look hard at ourselves, realize our own flaws, and then help others too. We want to reconcile our relationships with one another, but most of all our relationships with God. The purpose of seeing the speck or the log is to try to get ourselves closer to God and to stop letting that thing separate us. So I'd ask you to, this morning to give an honest review of yourself. When I thought of this, I, I was thinking of the way we tend to choose people to do work for us nowadays. It's the review. You know, there was a time where it was word of mouth. There was a time it was uh, you would have seen their work somewhere. Too often now, it's you Google, uh, I need a contractor in Ada, Oklahoma. And you will Google that, and you'll see a series of names come up. And then with most of them, you'll, you will see stars next to their names. And so then you will click on that, and you will go, and you will look at the stars, and you will see what people think of these folks. And I've learned a lot through that. I've learned that sometimes people give really good, honest reviews, and what they say is true, and you can learn a lot from those reviews that you read. I've seen other times that people have an axe to grind. Uh, there is just this cruelty of the way the world works of, on Google, even if you are the organization or the company, you cannot get rid of this. It's just there. You can try to dispute it, but the people at Google, whoever works in that department, uh, they clock out at the end of the day, and they're just not going to stick with that. There have been at uh, churches I have worked at always at least one unfair review. And oftentimes, it's not even someone who has ever been to the church. It's just someone who has an axe to grind of Christianity or whatever. And they'll go find a random church one day, give them a one-star review, and say something about them. Uh, if you try to reach out to them in email, you'll find out they've never, they don't, they've never been to Ada. They've never been to whatever town you're in. They just they don't like God, and so they do this. With businesses, you will find the same thing. There was a uh, shooting several years ago in Tulsa where a police officer shot uh, a person. And there was, as happens oftentimes in these things, uh, all of the uproar in, in culture about it. There was a court case that came with it. That church learned very quickly that they started getting one after another after another. This police officer was a member of the church. That church started getting one after another after another one-star reviews. And it was because of the police officer. People didn't like it, and they were trying to find some way to lash out, and so this is the way they chose to do it. We as Christians have to be honest with one another. And that begins by being honest with ourselves. Do we have the log in our own eye? And I will tell you that when you look in the mirror, it will not look like this to you. You may not even see it. And maybe because you're so accustomed to it, maybe because you just taught yourself not to look at it, but all of us have something. All of us have sin that we struggle with, things that we know we need to be closer to God about, and we're so much quicker to see it with someone else. This morning, I would encourage you, if your first inclination is to look to another person and to see the flaw, to begin to instead look within and find the things that we need to get better about. And then secondly, that other person with the flaw, it, it's probably real. You probably are seeing something that's actually there, but how do we handle that? Do we handle that in love? Do we handle that in a desire for reconciliation? Do we handle that with mercy? Do we handle that in such a way that acknowledges, I struggle with, and let's help each other with these things? Or do we handle it in a way that places ourselves above and then below? And if that is your way, whether it's consciously or subconsciously, let me encourage you to begin to change that today if for no other reason that the way that we judge is the way we will be judged. And none of us want that. Or this morning, if you have found yourself on the wrong side of that too often, maybe you're watching online and you haven't entered a church building in a very long time because that's how those Christians are, know that we all don't want to be that way. And sometimes we're good at it and sometimes we're not. But we all want to be closer to the God that we serve. 
And today know that that is not the way that God judges. God judges with a mercy and a desire for reconciliation and wants you to come back to him. So if you've never followed him for the first time or you need to come back, if there's anything we can do as your church family, please come while we stand and sing.